What's a secret about AI that no one's telling us? What's the best B2B strategy for a small business with a national audience? What's the best alternative to a website? If you could have a superpower to enhance your digital marketing skills, what power would you choose and why? Who has been your most unusual or memorable guest? I answer all these questions and more in this milestone for the Agents of Change podcast, episode 500. The questions come from you. The answers come from me. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Agents of Change, the podcast experience you've been waiting for your entire marketing career. Search, social, mobile, AI, blockchain, and neuromarketing. These are the Agents of Change, and so are you. Digital marketing success awaits, and your transformation begins now. Welcome to another episode of the Agents of Change podcast, the podcast that's all about helping you reach more of your ideal clients. My name is Rich Brooks, and this is not just another episode. This is episode 500, brought to you by the Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference. Yes, this is it. Episode 500. We are finally here. Hallelujah! As I mentioned several weeks ago, I planned on doing a mailbag episode for episode 500, and I got a number of great questions from many of you out there. Thank you very much. And because I am all in on AI these days, I also asked ChatGPT and Claude, two of my favorite LLMs, large language models, for a few questions as well. But let's start with the humans. Susan Kajowski had the following question. What's a secret about AI that no one's telling us? I'm not sure there's a secret about AI that no one's telling us. Well, actually, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's a bunch, but they're not telling me either. But if I can shift your question just a little bit to talk about some of the myths or misunderstanding around AI, well, then I've got a few. First, if you're not sure how to do something in AI, just ask it. Here's one simple example. I wasn't getting the results in MidJourney that I wanted. MidJourney, if you're not familiar with it, is a generative AI image creation tool. So basically you can go in there, give it a prompt, and it will draw or paint or create what you're looking for or what it thinks you're looking for. I tried time and time again. I just couldn't get what I wanted to. So I went over to Claude, a ChatGPT competitor that's also an LLM, as I mentioned before, and asked it to help me craft one, which it did. And although it wasn't perfect, it got me a lot closer and ultimately I figured it out. So I asked one AI to help me figure out something on another AI. I also watched a friend develop out a business plan with ChatGPT. At specific times within the conversation, she asked it questions like, where does this Python code, which you just wrote for me, go? How will this connect to the database? What software already exists that might compete with this product? What am I not thinking about that I should consider? What are the pain points of my customer in regards to what this product can do? And how can I craft this into an RFP to send out to developers? And so on. So she was literally just asking it to help. And very often, if you're not getting the results you want, you can just ask it, how can you give me better results? What information are you looking for from me so that you can do it. It actually brings up a third thought that I had or a third example that I had where I was starting to look to forecast for 2024 flights flights financials and I just decided that maybe I would ask ChatGPT to help. So I asked it, what information would you need from me to help me forecast a very positive year in 2024? And it just gave me a list of all the things, the reports that I needed, the financial outlook, the what the competitors were doing, so that it could basically take all that information and try and help me develop out a, a forecast for 2024. Secret two, if these are secrets. Well, you've heard that two brains are better than one, right? Well, two AIs can also be better than just one. I mean, I'm already using tools like ChatGPT or Claude as sounding boards or ideation machines. But I saw this trick on a Slack group that I belong to recently, so I had to try it out for myself. 
For a recent blog post, I asked Claude to help me work up a framework for my idea. When it was complete, five seconds later, I copied and pasted it into ChatGPT and asked it to make improvements based on my objectives and my audience. It added a few ideas that Claude hadn't included. Then I brought that version back to Claude and asked it if it could make any further improvements. It made some suggestions, and then I asked it to synthesize the best ideas into a final framework. Finally, stop thinking of AI as a replacement for personnel. At this stage of the game, the AI game, you should be looking for AI to relieve you of repetitive, boring tasks. You be th should be thinking of it as a productivity tool. Can you use it to create a framework for a blog post, saving you an hour of prep time? Can you have it write the first draft of your social posts and email you to promote that or email uh, or create an email to promote that blog post? Can you have it identify 10 thought leaders or influencers that you can reach out to for a quote, an interview, or a potential collaboration, saving you that research time? So I'd worry less about the secrets of AI and just start trying to work it into your day with the idea of helping you save time and freeing up yourself to do your best work. My second question, you know, I really wish that I had like some sound effects here so it sounds like I'm reaching around this giant mailbag of traditional mail to pull this out and then maybe a letter opening sound. So you're just gonna have to use your imagination. My second question comes from Don and he asks, with all the post COVID changes, the new social landscapes and so on, what do you think is the best B2B strategy or approach for a small business, really a micro company with a national customer base? In our case, we sell database access to university and libraries of historic maps and antiquities. We tried around on LinkedIn for several months and it was just a dud. I assume uh, LinkedIn ads. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, thought that with a LinkedIn job title role targeting, this would be a hit. We are just starting a Facebook round as Facebook has added more role type targeting of ads. Okay, Don, great question. My gut check when I received your question was optimizing your website for search and leveraging LinkedIn for prospecting, which it sounds like in some cases you've already started down that pathway. I'm sure you already have clients in the university and library market. Do a 30-minute interview with some of your best clients and make sure that you understand what their pain points were when they went searching for a solution, how they found you, and why they chose you. I've got an episode coming up in the next few weeks on how to develop personas that you're definitely going to want to check out, Don. Now, once you have a sense of that, make sure that all your service pages speak to that persona, addressing their needs and concerns. Make sure you're writing blog posts that also help those type of customers in the early stages of their customer journey, the awareness and consideration stages. Share those blog posts through an opt-in email newsletter to stay in front of mind or stay front of mind with your audience and talk about those posts on LinkedIn, becoming a thought leader in the space. Now on LinkedIn, make sure you or your sales team spend some time each week building out your network of prospects through searching job titles and identifying key decision makers at different libraries and universities that you want to do business with. Make sure the sales team and the company leaders are posting interesting content into the newsfeed at least twice a week to build awareness and engagement. I do that before I spend any more money on LinkedIn ads, although once you've nailed down your personas, I might consider rolling out ads again. Remember that LinkedIn ads tend to be more expensive than other social platforms for customer acquisition, so make sure you've got a budget that can support it. I'd say $1,500 to $2,000 per month per campaign. If you're planning on running more than one campaign at a time, that would be a good starting point. And I probably wouldn't spend my energy on Facebook ads. Let's just call them meta ads because we'll throw Instagram in there too. I wouldn't spend my energy or money on meta ads right now. If anything, meta's ability to target customers has gone down, not up in the past few years. You'll definitely need to invest more time upfront in just generating first-person data for Meta before you can expect to get any results from it. In other words, a month or two of ads targeting people you think would be interested, maybe based on their job titles, just to engage them, not even to sell to them. And that's what will help Facebook get trained up on who's likely, ultimately, going to buy from you. Now, you could try retargeting ads on Meta, but here's my concern. The people you want to get in front of probably have a work email 
and a personal email, just like they have a work computer at the library or university and a home computer. That's going to make retargeting so much harder, as retargeting is often based on your email address or your browsing habits. If they visit your website at work, but Facebook at home, it's almost like they're two different people. And same thing with their email addresses. If you have their work email address and you load that into Facebook, well, maybe that won't make a connection because they signed up for Facebook under their personal email and not their work email. And thus, it's really just hard to connect them. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that I don't feel that that's the low hanging fruit. All right, now let's get to the meat of this because all of what I've shared so far are best practices and relatively generic advice for anybody in your industry or trying to target that audience. It's not bad advice. It's just a little bit broad without digging any deeper. I'd probably say something similar to anybody who came in with a similar situation. So now I'll share what I found. So I, I think I tracked down your website and I have some updated advice for you. Now, this is assuming that I got the right website. I'm not going to say what it is, but here's my advice. Get a new website. And I know that comes across as a little harsh, but if I'm at the website that I believe to be yours, it does not speak at all to your ideal customer. Even if you sell it to both consumers and the audience working in university and libraries, I don't see any content for that latter group at all. If you run a kind of business that might have different audiences, in this case, maybe there's a B2B market and a B2C market, right on the home page, you should have jumping off points, one that would talk to B2C consumers, one that would talk to B2B, the universities and the libraries that need your services, because they're going to come to you for very different reasons. They're going to have different needs and you would have a different conversation with them if they walked into your office and just had some questions for you. Also, your website is not mobile friendly. It looks like it's from another internet age. I saw it on the desktop and I also visited on my iPhone as well. And you're heavily promoting on your website, on the homepage, you're heavily promoting your activity on Facebook and Instagram, but that's not the role of your website. The role of your social media beyond branding and awareness is to drive traffic to your website, not the other way around. If someone from a university or library looking for an important database access comes to your website, I'm concerned that the dated look and feel of the website matched up with the fact that it's not mobile friendly is going to send the wrong message. A sophisticated service like yours needs a sophisticated website and brand. Now, if the site I visited isn't the one that you sell to your ideal clients, your university and library owners, then you can ignore all the previous advice that I just gave you, more or less. But in visiting your LinkedIn profile, I'm seeing that the last time you posted was four months ago, and before that, it was four years ago. I'd love to see you posting at least once a week, focusing on this business, focusing on maybe pulling out something really interesting from your database, showing some really interesting old map or antiquity and talking about this and maybe talking about how this could help solve a problem that's likely a pain point of this audience that you're trying to get in front of. You seem to have a lot of interest and are involved in multiple businesses, but if your main goal is to build up this database business, for your company, then you need to give that at least 95% of your attention on LinkedIn. I hope that helps. Next up, I have a couple of questions that have a similar theme. Jeff Pearl asks, what's the best site to use for business in place of a website? LinkedIn, Medium, Facebook, Blogger, etc. And Joanna Free, author of Butt Kickers, asks, each time it got to a place where it seemed dated or stale or the tech was glitching and I didn't exactly know how to fix it or stay on top of it or I was second guessing every single line of copy in it. She's talking about her website here. Eventually, I just pulled the plug and took it down. Sadly, I lost blog post and history each time I did this, but I just couldn't seem to get out of my own way. Do you or other listeners relate to this at all? What are your thoughts? And do we still really need a website? I have a friend who has never had one, is not even on social media, and she always runs with a wait list for her services, but maybe we all know somebody like this. Great questions, and obviously you can see that they're thematically connected. So, of course, you're asking a guy who started a web design firm 26 years ago about whether you need a website or not, so I'm a little biased, but here goes. There is no substitute for a website, Jeff. Joanna, 
your friend is an outlier. Good for her, but she's the exception that proves the rule. Actually, I hate that saying, the exception that proves the rule. It's a terrible excuse to dismiss real evidence that doesn't fit in with your worldview. So let me try again. Joanna. Many of us know that person who has survived and even thrived seemingly without marketing or advertising, without website or storefront. It happens. I have clients who really don't need much marketing or advertising help from us. They just like working with us or really like the branding and design we do for them to help them share their message. They have the right product for the right audience and have very little in the way of competition. Or they've been doing it for so long, pre-internet even, that they can continue with their current clients and strong word of mouth. Or they only need a few clients and it's the type of business that keeps clients for years. Or they're able to charge such a premium that they don't need additional business. Or they have an incredible network or networking ability and that's how they land new business. Or they're doing something so new and so different and so unrepeatable and so remarkable that they naturally attract all the business they'll ever need. Yes, there are people in businesses like that, but for us mere mortals, we need a website. We need SEO or paid search or social or paid social or webinars or email marketing or a podcast or a YouTube channel or something to put us in front of the people who need us most. And we also need the website. For your issue specifically, taking down your website every time because you're second guessing every single line of copy, my advice to you is... Stop. Stop doing that. Perfection is the enemy of progress, according to Winston Churchill, and I tend to agree with him. Here's a story that has a few different variations on the web, but since the first time I heard it, it was about a photography class, and since this version seems to have the most detail and citations, let's go with this one. A professor at the University of Florida, according to author James Clear, divided his film photography class into two groups. One group would be graded on the quantity or amount of work they produced. The professor would simply add up the photographs submitted to him with students turning in 100 receiving an A, 90 photos earning a B, and so on. The other group would be graded on the quality or excellence of their work. They could submit if they wanted as little as one image, but it would need to be nearly perfect. Which group in this limited experience produced the best photos? The quantity or the quality group? Now, before I go on, I just want to say when they say the best work, they're not even just talking about the best grades, but literally, objectively, the best photos. It goes on. In this case, the group focusing on quantity produced the best photos. The photography students in the quantity group took lots of pictures, experimented with lighting, tried different compositions, and improved their skills. They were indeed learning, creating their own feedback loops, and ultimately producing great work. Okay, so early blog posts or videos or podcasts are like when you bring your date home to meet your mom and she brings out your baby pics. It's embarrassing, right? I'm sure my first few blog posts were crap. My first dozen podcasts were garbage. And my first few videos as handsome as my mom continues to tell me that I am, are unwatchable. And that's fantastic. Nowhere to go but up, right? I tell my kids all the time that if you don't suck at something at first, it's probably not worth doing. Sucking at something is part of the process. So go finish that website, that imperfect website. Start writing and suck at it. You have my permission to suck at it. And by trying to write every day and not getting caught up in perfection, you will progress towards greatness. Don't let your friend's magical ability to attract clients without an online presence distract you from your journey. If it makes you feel any better, few people will see your early attempts at blogs, emails, and what have you. You build an audience as you get better at sharing your unique perspectives and helping your ideal customers. And you do that through quantity, which leads to quality. And Jeff, I'm sure you realize this already. In my opinion, there is no replacement for your website. LinkedIn, Medium, Facebook, TikTok, these are outposts. They're not your property. You wouldn't go build your house on someone else's property or a public field, would you? Of course not, because you have no control over it. This is because even though these platforms can be helpful, they are their own businesses. They are happy to help you succeed as long as what you're doing 
is in alignment with what their objectives are. Businesses used to thrive on Facebook, reaching hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of fans with every organic or unpaid post. Now, they're lucky if they reach 1% of their fans, because Facebook decided that Facebook's interest was in selling ads, not in giving free advertising to businesses. Jeff and Joanna, I hope that helped. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I also turned to both Claude and ChatGPT for some questions to ask me on my 500th episode. Specifically, what are some unusual questions to ask a podcast host of a digital marketing show that's celebrating its 500th episode? That was the prompt I used identically in both ChatGPT and in Claude. Let's turn this into a lightning round. First, the five best questions I got from Claude. Who has been your most unusual or memorable guest? My answer is ChatGPT. You should go check out that episode if you haven't listened to it yet. What is the strangest fan interaction you've had? Well, I have to admit that I don't have that many fan interactions. I'm not really this huge celebrity, and generally it doesn't come up in conversations. But I have had it happen, especially if I'm at a conference, a digital marketing conference. But probably the strangest and possibly best fan interaction I ever had was the guy who showed up to the Agents of Change conference a few years ago who had created a spray-painted version of the Agents of Change logo as his shirt. I thought that was pretty cool. You know what I'm talking about, the spray paint like you do when you see at the county fairs and stuff and they do that. That's what he had done, and uh, I just loved it, that somebody created fan art based on something that I had been involved in creating. That was probably it. Have you ever fallen asleep while recording an episode? No, I haven't even fallen asleep when doing post-production. What topic could you talk about for 500 more episodes and never get bored? AI, probably. Can you share any funny outtakes that were accidentally recorded? Okay, this goes back to when the podcast was in its first 100 episodes and it was called The Marketing Agents, not The Agents of Change. But I was interviewing Amy Porterfield and she was actually recording her side of the conversation from inside her car. And in the middle of the interview, she's all of a sudden saying, oh, my God, the woman who's in the car next to me, I think she just collapsed on the ground. She's a little old lady. I got to go help her. And so she did. And basically just the, the tape kept on running, but she got out of the car, checked on the woman, helped her up. She was fine and then got back in the car and finished the interview. Amy Porterfield is a true professional. All right. Now, Claude included a postscript after the questions that it created, and it said, The key is to ask lighthearted, fun questions that touch on memorable moments over 500 episodes rather than just focusing on the digital marketing topics themselves. Questions that reveal funny stories or behind-the-scenes insights from the long run of the show are likely to engage both the host and listeners. So that gave a little bit of context of the type of questions that Claude asked me. And now my five favorite from ChatGPT. If you could have a superhero's power to enhance your digital marketing skills, Which power would you choose and why? Well, I considered the power of an empath because it would be nice to be able to really understand what my customers think about and put myself in their shoes. But I thought that that might not work since marketing is often one to many and I wasn't standing directly in front of them. Probably a better power for sales and marketing, but likely superhuman intelligence. Just being able to be that smart would be great. Or perhaps speed would be a good one too when I need to get out more blog posts. Choose a historical figure and imagine they were a digital marketer in today's age. Who would they be and what kind of campaigns would they run? I'd like to read Ben Franklin's blog. Or maybe he'd have a YouTube channel like Mark Rober, the former NASA engineer, showing his experiments like tying a key to a kite string as one of the videos he created. You're stranded on a desert island with one guest from your past episodes. Who would it be and why? None. That sounds too much like Love Island for me and I don't want to get in trouble. You're given a mystery box and you have no idea what's inside. How would you market it? I think it would market itself. But maybe pitch the idea that only the person who buys it will ever really know what's inside. I could talk about scarcity, how there's only one. Or perhaps I'd use it to build my email list. I'd give it away to one person who signed up during the month of October. Finally, If you had to go on a year-long digital detox starting tomorrow, but could leave your audience with one final tip, what would it be? Well, I did give up my smartphone, more or less, for a month as part of a stunt for my TV appearances on 207 so that I could talk about what it was like 
to use my phone only as a phone. No internet, no social media, no games, no Google, no maps, etc. But what is that final piece of advice I'd give? Maybe this. Outside of your website, the platforms matter less than you think they do. Focus more on understanding your audience and creating content that serves them well on their journey. ChatGPT also had a postscript to give me a little bit of context about why it chose the questions it asked. These questions are not just entertaining, but also give the podcast hosts a chance to think deeply and provide insights into their journey, beliefs, and the evolution of the digital marketing landscape. So who do you think asked better questions, Claude or ChatGPT? I think it was close, but ChatGPT's questions felt too much like a riff on Barbara Walters' questions, so I'm going to give my tip of the hat to Claude. Now, Susan, who asked the first question that I read about the AI secrets, she had a few other questions as well. I appreciated this question of hers as it allows me to be completely self-serving. Her question was, I'm going to be in Portland for the Agents of Change conference. What's the don't miss thing that I need to make sure to do while I'm in town? Excellent question. Now, let's assume that you're going to be at the Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference all day on Wednesday, October 5th, 2023, as the doors open at 7.30 a.m. and the networking party afterwards will go to at least six or seven. If you're up for dinner or drinks after, here are a few of my favorite haunts that feel very Portland-esque. Blythe and Burles, a nautically themed bar with some of the most creative cocktails in town. There's also an oyster bar up a little flight of stairs and another dive bar that's hidden behind a bookshelf at the back of the bar. Also, if you want lobster while you're in town, High Roller probably has the best lobster roll in town, plus some Creative Bloody Marys as well. Or you can have one down at the Portland Lobster Company, which is right on the wharf and often featuring live music. And there are literally a hundred amazing restaurants in Portland, so it hurts me, hurts me, not to name them all, but one of my favorites is a Zakaya Minato, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, on Washington Ave here in Portland. I've never had a bad meal there, and they also have excellent cocktails. Now, chances are you're also, Susan, attending our deep dive workshops on Thursday, October 5th, and maybe you're attending both the morning and the afternoon sessions. We've got some great deep dive workshops. Everybody should check them out. Now, you'll still have time for an early breakfast beforehand, so you might want to check out Becky's Diner, a fixture in town where lobstermen and tourists rub elbows over hearty breakfast meals. Other things you can do include just walking around the Old Port because it's got great stores, restaurants, and bars. The Portland Museum of Art is a great couple of hours well spent. If you like cemeteries, and really, who doesn't? Check out the Eastern Cemetery or Evergreen Cemetery. Both have long histories here in town. I also like hopping a ferry and visiting some of the islands out on Casco Bay. You can rent a bike or a golf cart and check out Peaks Island as one possibility. And since Portland is such a historic city, consider taking one of the tours, walking tours, bus tours, ship tours, or even duck tours. And for a nice walk, just outside of Portland, go to Mackworth Island, which is reachable by car, and walk the loop of the island. It'll take you about 45 minutes. I hope that gives you a few ideas. I know you were looking for just one of what to do when you're not learning from digital marketing experts from across the U.S. and Canada at this year's Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference. Well, that's it for episode 500. 500. It has been a hell of a ride, and I see no signs of it slowing down. Being able to connect with so many smart and interesting people, the guests who come on the show, who share a lot of the same passions that I have, has been nothing short of incredible. Although sometimes I feel like having a podcast is like speaking into a black hole. I mean, after all, I can't see you. When I do have interactions with listeners, it's always rewarding and enjoyable. I appreciate when you reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me you listened to the show or that you enjoyed a certain guest. I'd say it all makes it worthwhile, but honestly, it was already worthwhile. This just adds frosting on top. Or gravy. Depends what I'm eating. I hope to see you all at the Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference this year in Portland, Maine on October 4th and 5th. If you can't make it, I hope you can see the value in the speakers that we've curated to speak and grab a virtual ticket so you can watch both live and on demand. You can get all of the information about all of the tickets and the VIP pass we have at theagentsofchange.com. 
Other than that, we've got some amazing guests coming your way. Experts in AI, in personas, in getting your company on Wikipedia, the list goes on. We've got hundreds of more topics to cover, hundreds of more experts to meet, and I look forward to celebrating episode 1000 with you in about 2033. Cheers, and thanks for making all of this possible, and for being an agent of change. Don't miss another thrilling episode of the Agents of Change podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform.